the wilderness tabernacle is measured in what is called a cubit. Now, there were two major types of cubits used in the ancient world. Whether you lived in the area of Mesopotamia or Egypt, you would use the two basic standards. One was a common cubit, and that was based on six handbreadths. Now, a handbreadth for the ancient world would be from the base of the fingers down to the base of the palm, also called a palm breadth. It was approximately three inches in length. Now, the common cubit would actually be about 17 and a half inches. Now, there was also a measurement of a cubit called the royal cubit. Also, too, one, one other in interesting fact is, is that we have the number seven, and seven is a very prominent number throughout Judaica. Now, in Egypt, Moses, when he studied there, he would have used in many of the buildings the royal Egyptian cubit, which was seven handbreadths, or about 21 inches, or 20 and a half inches. And many scholars believe that based on this, and based on the tools that he would have had and used in Egypt, that the wilderness tabernacle was based on the royal cubit of Egypt. The first piece of furniture found inside of the tabernacle is the seven-branch menorah. Now actually it was one main branch and then three sets of two branches attached. Now the menorah was, was made out of pounded gold, pure gold, which demonstrated the purity and the honor and the glory of God. It also was the light of the tabernacle. Now each of the branches was composed of a branch itself and attached to it were three items at the very top. We have an oil lamp that was in the shape of an almond. Toward the base of it, attaching it to the remainder of the other branches, we have what is called a knop. Now the knop was the attachment item, and it was in the shape of a bud, many believe. And then for beauty on the branch, we have a flower that was around the branch itself. The next piece of furniture found in the wilderness tabernacle is the table of showbread. Now it was made out of a wood called shittim, or also we call this gopher's wood. This was a common wood of the area, and it was covered with a beautiful, pure gold. Now on top of this, every week, the priest would place 12 loaves of unleavened bread, and, on, and sprinkled on top of these loaves would be frankincense, a, a white, sweet-smelling spice of that time period. Now, the table of showbread was a symbol in itself of the provision of God. Bread in itself, throughout the Bible, was a picture of provision. And being unleavened bread, there was no symbolic sin, because leaven was a symbol of sin in the Bible. And together with the sweet savor of the frankincense, we see the beauty and the sweetness of the great perfect provision of God found on this table. The next piece of furniture found in the wilderness tabernacle is the altar of incense. It was covered with pure gold, and the gold itself was symbolic of the glory and the purity of God. Now also, it had a ridge around the, the top portion called the crown. The crown was solid gold. It had two staves or two poles that the priest would carry it with as they would move the tabernacle furnishings. Now on this altar of incense daily, both in the morning and in the evening, the high priest and the other priest who served in the tabernacle would place the incense and it would burn. Now the incense itself was symbolic of the prayers of the Jewish people going before God. The final item in the wilderness tabernacle, in a room by itself, a room called the Holy of Holies, was located the Ark of the Covenant. This in itself was the symbol of the presence of God. Inside of the Ark we have three items, the, uh, the rod that budded of Aaron, a pot of manna, as well as the Ten Commandments, the, the tablets written by God's finger. On the sides of the Ark of the Covenant, we have two staves, one on each side, where the priest would carry this ark as the wilderness tabernacle traveled. Now these staves were attached permanently to the Ark of the Covenant with golden rings. Now we're also told that with the ark we have the mercy seat. They were in essence the same, and I, I will explain. The ark itself was a box made out of gopher's wood, and it was covered with beautiful pure gold. On top of the box were two cherubim and the mercy seat. The mercy seat, in essence, was the golden lid of the ark. Now, this was the prominent item in the entire tabernacle. 
This is where the presence of God would be seen. And once a year on, in Yom Kippur, the high priest would come to this room and offer up the sacrificial blood on this Ark of the Covenant. And the presence of God would manifest himself here. The overall design and makeup of the Wilderness Tabernacle and what was done there with the Jewish people, their worship experience, was both similar as well as very unique compared to other nations of that time period. The tent worshiping that was done by many families around this part of the world. And many families did have tents of worship. One of the major differences between the Tabernacle and other worship sites was the lack of idols, of the gods that you would see in the foreign and the pagan temples and the pagan tents of worship. Very interesting. The whole tabernacle pointed the Jewish person to the relevance and the, and the relationship of God. Yet there is never found a picture of this deity. And that in itself, I believe, separates at least this part of the tabernacle worship, its structure and how it was composed from all other edifices of worship. And it's based on what God himself stated, that there should be no idols to worship, that we are to worship God in heaven, the creator, and not the creation. Now we are told in the Bible that the Jewish people made the wilderness tabernacle and many of the panels out of linen. Now we know that they were shepherds and they would have had sheep for wool, but where would the linen come from? When we go to the story found in Exodus, talking about the ten plagues of Egypt, we are told at the very end of the plagues, right after Pharaoh released the Jewish people from their bondage, God basically caused the Egyptians to find favor with, with the Jewish people. And they gave them not only jewels, as well as gold, but they also gave them tapestries. And many scholars believe that these tapestries would have been the finest linen tapestries from all of Egypt. Now, linen was a very special type of cloth. It was manufactured from a plant called flax. Now, flax was a plant that would only be found in areas that were moist, such as the Nile River area. Egypt was one of the greatest producers of linen in this ancient day. Now, in the Wilderness Tabernacle, though, why was linen used? Why would Egyptian cloth be used? Well, in general, linen was the cloth of royalty. And what better cloth to be used in a building that was erected to be a symbol for all of Israel, the place where they would meet God? It was a royal place. Now, there are two types of linen used in the tabernacle uh, making. You have the outer curtain was a very beautiful, colorful linen. Then both in the interior part of the tabernacle, in the interior layer of cloth, it was a white linen, as well as the priestly outfits, they were also white linen. Now in the Hebrew Bible, the word used for linen, both for the colorful as well as the white, was sheish. Now when it said fine linen, and that's the best translation usually given for the linen that the Jewish people used to build the tabernacle with, fine linen was composed of two different types. You had fineness in the quality of the material itself, but also fineness in the, in the color. Now, also very interesting, many of the priestly garbs were also made out of linen, white linen. Now, they chose this material over such a material such as um, like wool. Wool would be very hot in the wilderness, very, very hot. It would be sweaty, it would, you'd get dirty quickly, and that would cause a problem because, see, the priest had to maintain before the Lord a separation from the sinfulness of man because they were working and taking care of the furnishings of the tabernacle before God. Thus, they opted for the linen material. Linen was lightweight. It would breathe and it would, it would keep perspiration down. Thus, the sinfulness that, uh, that, that would accompany that, at least, at least symbolically, would not be seen in their work. So linen, a perfect material for the tabernacle, lightweight, very, very strong, and had a beautiful sheen, and it was the cloth of royalty.
One of the great fallacies that I come in contact with many times about the worship experience done at the Wilderness Tabernacle is the idea and the concept that on the Day of Atonement, which is called Yom Kippur in the Hebrew language, the high priest, when he would enter into the Holy of Holies, they would have a rope tied to his ankle and the bells on the bottom of his outfit, if he were not accepted and he were struck down dead, the bells would sound and they would pull him out by his ankle out of the Holy of Holies. Now I say that this is a fallacy because it's not found in the Bible. And one of the major problems with this story is that when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, he is not wearing the normal high priestly robe, which contains the breastplate and the, the robe that did have the bells. He wears a plain white common priestly outfit for this day. Thus, there is no bells present. And the idea of wrapping us uh, or tying a rope around his ankle to pull him out, never found in Scripture, never found even in the Talmud. It is strictly just fallacy, strictly just a tradition. Now, it could be based on, though, a common fear of this day. We must realize on the Day of Atonement, this was the day when the Jewish people were going to have their sins covered for a year before God. Thus, when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, everyone around would hold their breath. Would God accept this high priest and the sacrifice, or would he re reject it and do away with the high priest? And as that high priest emerged from after doing his work in that Holy of Holies, a sigh of relief ran throughout the camp of Israel. Thus, from this fear, I believe that this fallacy came about the idea of the rope being attached to the ankle of the high priest on the Day of Atonement. One item in the wilderness tabernacle and in the wall of linen that surrounded it that many people do not uh, think about were the sockets that the poles that held up and supported the wilderness tabernacle were placed in. The outer wall, which was the wall of separation that separated the camp of Israel from the presence of God. Symbolically, that wall of linen was basically a symbol of the law of God. Once one would enter into the area of the tabernacle, they were under judgment of the law from God himself. Outside, they were in the camp of Israel. Now, the sockets that were used to hold the poles that held up the wall on the outer wall were made out of bronze or brass or copper. The Hebrew word used for this metal and in describing these sockets could mean either one of those three. This material, or this metal, basically also had a symbolic idea of judgment and the law of God did judge the people of Israel. Now for the tabernacle itself though, it was held up by 100 poles. Each one of these poles were placed in a socket made out of silver, a different metal. Now this metal silver, this was one particular metal that was not a gift to the people of Israel to, to build or to make the wilderness tabernacle. See, all of the metals used, including the gold and the bronze and the brass, used in all of the articles around the tabernacle, were donated by the people themselves. But the silver, this was from a tax that was given out during the censuses uh, conducted throughout the various years. And this was a tax that was given against Israel, and this silver was used to build and to make these various sockets. Thus, the sockets of the tabernacle, even though many don't think much about them, they were very significant, not only in their use, but also symbolically pointing one to the worshiping of God. One of the prominent features of the Ark of the Covenant were the cherubims that were placed on top of it. Now a question comes to many people's minds, what did they look like? Do we have a good portrayal of them on the Ark of the Covenant? Well, I do believe we do, because it's based on what the Bible tells us of them. But the answer to this question is problematic, because throughout the scriptures, cherubim are, dis are described different ways at different times. Now we know for sure, and this is one, uh, one item that is, that is set throughout the scriptures dealing with cherubim, 
is that they all have two wings. We are also told that they all have straight legs. And they have a prominent place before God. But as far as anything else, then it varies. Some have the face of a man. Some have the face of an eagle. Some have the face of an oxen. All of these facial features, many scholars believe, point to different qualities that God wants us to see in their visages. Now, as far as the number of the cherubim, that's also a, a, a difficult question to answer. Now, we know in particular, God said to place two cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant. Many times throughout the history of the Jewish people, we see multiple cherubim depicted. So many scholars would agree that there are multiple cherubim. We just don't know exactly how many, but we do know for sure. God said to place two cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant. From the very beginning of time, after Adam sinned, God established a sacrificial system with his people so that they could become righteous before God's eyes. The sacrificing of animals on the altars. Now throughout the centuries, after the time of Adam, as various people started to drift away from God and develop their own religions, almost every religion of the ancient time period used altars. Now sometimes the altars were made out of stone, Sometimes they were made out of, out of metal, sometimes out of earth. However they were made, though, they had one thing in common. It was a place to redeem oneself before their own gods. Now God, when he established the tabernacle worship, he also had the Jewish people establish an altar of sacrifice. Now this altar was seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long, and about four and a half feet tall. Now it was made out of gopher's wood, and it was covered with a metal. Now the name in Hebrew used for this metal could either mean brass, bronze, or copper. Now through various testings, some scholars have pointed out that probably it was of a copper material. Now we are told in the Bible that there were cross beams or that there were staves that, that the priest would pick this altar up and carry it as they traveled through the wilderness, as the Jewish people traveled. Some scholars have also mentioned because of the weight of this altar of sacrifice, that there probably were cross beams placed underneath the staves, thus allowing more than just four individuals to carry the altar, allowing actually up to eight to 12 individuals to carry it. Now the altar was very important for the Jewish people. This was the place where temporary redemption was found. And in essence, symbolically it pointed to the day when God himself desired to redeem mankind permanently. Many individuals have a special question. Where is the Ark of the Covenant? Such a prominent item in Jewish history, why is it missing? Just prior to, to the Babylonian captivity, we know that the priest hid the Ark of the Covenant. That was at 586 BC. In 516 BC, when Zerubbabel finishes rebuilding the Second Temple, it is not present at that time. Now, when the Romans took control over all of Israel, King Herod was made king, he started another rebuilding process of the temple. During that period in history, there was also no Ark of the Covenant. Why is it missing? Some have claimed that the Ark of the Covenant is currently in Ethiopia. Some have claimed that it's buried under the Temple Mount. There are numerous views about the Ark and numerous places that people claim it has been found. In my studies in this topic, I, in, in my research, I've come to one conclusion. At this time in history, I do not believe we know where the ark is. But I do place it in God's hands. We know that he is a sovereign God, and he does not just let things slip by. He is in control. And I do believe that he has in, is in total control of where the ark is placed. But let me also share this with you. It is not really a needed item in today's world. See, the ark was a symbol of God's presence. At the time it was used in the Old Testament, it was a time when Israel needed a symbol for a portrayal of God's presence. But 2,000 years ago, 
God left the glories of heaven. He was born in a manger and died at Calvary. And he lives today as our Savior. With him, we have God. With the ark, we have a symbol of God. Do we really need the symbol? And another scholar once said, there are numerous things in the Bible that we don't have today, such as the cross of Christ. We don't have the body of Moses. We don't have the original copies of the, of the scriptures, the actual books. Why don't we have these items? Well, this scholar once said that many times mankind takes the things of this world and makes them their God. And they do not put the same value on God in heaven. See, as a human being, many times we tend to worship things we see over things we don't. The issue of the missing ark, well, yes, some would say it's a concern. I don't think so. I believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. And it is given in great description what it was and what it was used for. And I am satisfied and it is sufficient for me to know that God knows where the ark is. And maybe one day he will reveal it to mankind.